you can just start from what you were saying a moment ago where we're recording. Uh -huh. Have you started recording? Yeah, I just did. Okay. Yeah, we'd like to discuss with you an area which, uh, which I'm not very happy still in the DAO code and where I don't have a really, still a really good solution. I have some idea, but uh, maybe you have some, some better view on it. Uh, maybe I give you a very rough overview about uh, the most important stuff you need to know to understand the problem. I probably we don't have time to go in into too much details in in all the parts, uh, but uh, in in maybe in another week or so when I'm kind of like uh, ready with um, for code review, it would be great that you go over the whole code base and then I can give you more context and and details. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, in the DAO we have uh, <coughs> we have this parser. Also, you are as a full node, or <coughs> you are. There's a little bit difference between full node and light node, but for this uh, co uh, discussion, so it's not really important. I I come for, um, I uh, yeah I, I talk about the full node now. The, that's the default, or not the default, but the the main uh, mode. <coughs> So uh, with every block uh, which you, you're listening on a local uh, Bitcoin core node and you get notified with every new block. <coughs> you are passing this block uh, that's happening in a special, uh, in a custom thread. It's not on the user thread. <coughs> and when you're passing a block, uh, yeah, you're requesting first uh, the block from the uh, Bitcoin core and then all the transactions. <coughs> and you are getting the transactions are already sorted by dependencies. So when there is an interblock dependency of transactions uh, you, uh, that will be uh, later in the passing process, like those transactions which don't have uh, dependencies to other outputs of the same block. So uh, yeah, you're, uh, you're passing every transaction and basically you're checking if this transaction is a valid BSQ transaction. The most simple form is the it's a spending transaction from the Genesis output. So you check yeah, if this uh, input uh, comes from an output from the Genesis transaction. If so, then it's a valid BSQ uh, output and your transaction is a BSQ transaction and uh, your output, uh, <coughs> which is covered by the uh, value, it will be a BSQ output. And we are storing all those transactions uh, in our own uh, data structure. It's called our DSQ blockchain, and it's a hierarchical data structure with blocks and transactions, and out, as in every transaction contains outputs and inputs and so on. So it's very similar to the data structure what you get from up, uh, via RPC from Bitcoin Core. And all this happens in this passing thread or the parser thread. It's only one thread which is doing it. doesn't make sense to do it parallel because otherwise you get uh, messed up with the ordering of transactions. The bottleneck there from performance is only the RPC. All the rest is super fast, uh, but these RPC calls are rather uh, slow. <coughs> um, yeah, and we are writing all this data to the BSQ blockchain. So that's uh, one part, and uh, of course the whole application wants to access this data. <clears throat> so we have this writing uh, issue there because uh, all this data is written from another thread. The user thread uh, scope uh, is accessing this data, like in the view. So you want to see those transactions and then in all the variations and so. And you're accessing this. I'm using our <coughs> a, a locking. As a, wait to show you the class. Maybe I make a screen sharing and then have a little bit more PSQ blockchain. <laughs> so Mike has wait, I started screen sharing. <laughs> yeah, start the whole. Do you see it already? Yeah, I can see. Uh, but maybe, maybe I make it for the application and we can make it a little bit smaller. Wait one second. Start again. Um, several applications. I hope this one should do it. <clears throat> no. So do you see the whole window? I can see the whole desktop, I think, yeah. At the whole desktop? 
Mm -hmm. it should be only this window, but yeah, it which is quite okay. I can see everything yeah. well. Okay, yeah, 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 it doesn't matter. <clears throat> yeah, we are using this functional read write. It's basically just a reentrant read write lock uh, <coughs> in the functional style. So we are when you're accessing or when you're writing, like add block here is the main method where you're adding a new block to the mm -hmm. the data structure. We set the write lock, then we're doing the stuff and uh, and here the listeners also which which are usually from other domains or from the uh, not the right uh, sometimes also the, the right leader UI that's mapped to the user thread with this execute uh, so uh, yeah then you're uh, you're notifying all the listeners <coughs> so the listeners and that's one of the main problems here uh, <coughs> that we are basically getting out of sync. <laughs> For instance, the chain height uh, was used, as I already uh, fixed uh, some of those issues. <clears throat> but there have been an issue that uh, you are looking up the chain height, the current, for a verification uh, if, a, if a transaction is in the correct phase, like a, a blind vote transaction, as we have different phases. First is compensation mm -hmm. request phase, and the <coughs> voting phase, which starts with the blind vote, and then with the reveal vote phase, and then the issuance phase. <coughs> and Every, uh, yeah, when you get those uh, data items from the peer to peer network, or when you do any verification, you always check if you're in the right cycle, as a cycle is the whole a collection of phases for one month uh, usually, and if you're in the right phase. So when you receive a, a transaction, a compensation request transaction, which is outside of the phase, it's invalid. <coughs> mm -hmm. And for checking this phase, we need to know uh, what's the yeah what's the chain height, uh, what in which context we are already. And earlier, I was using, I was accessing directly from the from this data structure the chain height, but uh, this <coughs> this thread for passing the code was already ahead, was already on a, on a higher number of uh, of blocks, like uh, the user thread, which got notified here on on every block and was doing the verification. It was behind, and then uh, yeah, we got uh, bugs and problems. <clears throat> That's already fixed. Uh, I take already now uh, the number from here. But it showed that it's a problematic setup that we have basically. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we are doing uh, we are doing verification stuff <clears throat> on it on the user thread, and the data is getting written on this other thread on this password thread, and I would like to get this. Uh, now everything on the same thread <clears throat> and I'm also wondering it also one problem was this threading issue and the other main problem is that uh, we have uh, this uh, <clears throat> yeah, this data structure which is the basic concept inherited from Bitcoin so you have these blocks and uh, get executed in the sequence and it's uh, base nearly so it's not 100% uh, immutable data because we have uh, in the uh, in the transaction output, for instance, there's a, a flag is unspent, and that will change when you have made a transaction and spent this output. Then it becomes, uh, yeah, is spent is uh, false. Then, <clears throat> and yet, uh, so may maybe let's start with this. That's probably the easier discussion. I was wondering to make the BSQ blockchain completely immutable, that uh, yeah, uh, you cannot change any data, <clears throat> and to extract all this mutable data, I can show you an example. Uh, another is, for instance, in the in the transaction itself, or is issuance transaction that gets set in the issuance or verification. So when you when your compensation request becomes really an issuance transaction, this uh, property will change. So usually it's false, and in certain cases, when it's issuance transaction, it changes and becomes true. So that's, uh, and as well, uh, transaction type during the passing, you are setting the correct transaction type. <clears throat> I mean, that could be done uh, in the in the constructor. I think we could uh, probably, yeah, that could be done. But, <clears throat> but especially the issuance transaction is a very special case, <coughs> which cannot be <clears throat> uh, easily, yeah, so usually uh, when you're writing those data, you are uh, in this block and, and you are writing the data for this block. <clears throat> but for the issuance transaction, you are rewriting a property in the past. So we are already in the end of the month with the voting, but the issuance transaction was done, other compensation request transaction was done at the beginning of the month. 
and you are changing the state of this transaction in the past. So that's uh, something which is uh, very different from the classical stuff what's happening in Bitcoin. <clears throat> In Bitcoin, it's just the unspent state, uh, and I don't know exactly how their data structure is handled in Bitcoin. I would love to get uh, more insight uh, how it's done really under the hood in, in Bitcoin. I'm just aware of this UTXO set, <coughs> and I assume that um, <coughs> that they separated uh, this uh, mutable state to an external data structure, this um, uh, uh, set or a map of unspent transaction outputs which get updated with every block or with every transaction and where you are <coughs> maintaining the mutable state outside of the main blockchain. And I was wondering if that would make sense as well that we are stripping out all the mutable data to external maps. I have it already, uh, like the UTXO set I have here also, uh, unspent uh, transaction output map <coughs> where I'm updating all the time when uh, when an output change the unspent state it get updated there <laughs> mainly also for uh, performance reason because yeah the blockchain can become quite large and when you would have to iterate always all the transactions to find uh, which transaction outputs are spent or unspent um, yeah it's a little bit heavy and uh, yeah so well, but the use and there would be more cases like this unspent. So, what's what there are the typical cases? Are, I think some of those I could I could already when I'm passing a transaction uh, that will not change afterwards. So a transaction has then a fixed type. <clears throat> Technically, I just get the transaction created <clears throat> from the. RPC uh, service, also we are requesting the data from Bitcoin Core. Uh, <clears throat> those are different data types, but which are similar to our data types, but I map them to our uh, data type to be independent of the RPC library. And there is this transaction uh, get created with this immutable data from the RPC call. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> And some, yeah, in, during the parser, we are setting our special properties like a uh, burnt fee or the transaction type or, uh, yeah, that's a little bit a special thing. In, let me look if there is something. Um, yeah, connected transaction output. That's when an input gets spent that will be uh, set at this moment. <coughs> that's immutable data as well. Um, yeah, it's verified. It's also when we have done the passing and we know if it's a, ver a valid PSQ transaction or not. And spend info is also, so all those are uh, also verified or uh, what we had in the transaction were special stuff for BISC, but spend info or the uh, connected transaction output, <clears throat> those are basically uh, data um, yeah, fields which are which are, um, I don't know exactly how they're handled in Bitcoin Core, uh, in Bitcoin itself, but um, they, um, they come from this domain directly. What do you think about, uh, about this data structure? Should we keep it like at the moment, which is more intuitive because you have a tree structure of all the objects and every object contains what's relevant to, the, to it? The alternative would be probably to have maps for all those uh, objects, like all the spend infos in one map, and then have a key which is unique to this transaction output. So the key of the transaction output is the transaction ID and the index. So the, yeah, the, the parent transaction output from where the output is uh, out, uh, going out, and the index, so the which, uh, which index of the outputs <coughs> it is. So that's a unique ID. So that could be then used as the <coughs> as the key in a map for all the spend infos. So you could look up then uh, the spend infos in such an external uh, data structure like we have already with this uh, unspent transaction output maps. <coughs> What's your opinion about uh, this question? Mm -hmm. um, let me just ask a couple of qualifying questions so that this this tree structure that you have now <coughs> uh, how is it persisted 
Yeah, it's persisted uh, locally to disk as protobuffer. So there's a protobuffer definition for the whole PSQ blockchain and all their, mm -hmm. their, uh, the objects inside of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we are, that's important background information. Uh, we are making snapshots. So we don't want to repass from the beginning every time when you start up the application and mm -hmm. snapshots. So, um, yeah, we can define how many blocks we want to make a snapshot, uh, for instance, every 100 blocks. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> When, uh, yeah, and we are shipping these snapshots with the code because a new user after one year or so, you don't want uh, that it takes um, quite a bit for, uh, I mean, the passing is super fast, but uh, still after one or two years, it will take some time and CPU. And the, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, the users can always um, delete the snapshot. There will be some feature where they can restart passing from beginning. I don't need to trust the developers that the snapshots are valid, but most people prefer probably convenience and want to get the snapshot from the latest release and then only do the passing what's missing, which is usually a maximum one month, and mm -hmm. that shouldn't take too long. <laughs> and and was, there, uh, was there any reason other than... Um, was there any reason to use protobuf here other than that's what we've been saving database information in elsewhere or was there any special requirement for it uh i'm also i want to not mix it up. um you think to use some alternative database format uh not necessarily i mean like in the bitcoin world this has been level db yeah um yeah. things like that right so so since that's kind of the default approach that people use just just want to yeah. see what the thinking was so far yeah i mean um it comes historically from as so earlier i was using our uh, java serialization and it was super convenient to to mm -hmm. persist data it was uh, yeah super easy to do it with protobuf it's of course much more effort and uh, to do it uh, with a classical database wouldn't be probably too much uh, much wouldn't wouldn't add too much effort <clears throat> I just never had um, yeah, the need and the time to really start to use a, a, a standard database for the data persistence. I mean, uh, uh, it would add some double effort because the protobuffer definitions are needed anyway for most of the data because most of those data which get persisted are sent over wire as well, 80% at least of those data also here. Uh, all this... Uh, all this value object like transactions and so they can send over the wire from the seed node to the light node as the light node is not doing uh, mm. the lookup or himself mm -hmm. it gets delivered all the psq transactions from the mm -hmm. seed node and only do the verification itself <clears throat> uh, so when we would add here uh, some database we had just additional work and we the protobuffer would need to be done anyway so <clears throat> And I think there are, there's not, at the moment, I think we don't have a performance issue uh, with this. Um, of course, it can be uh, optimized someday, but yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, but you don't, you don't foresee a, uh, an upfront uh, mm. disk space or, or no. read performance or no. this just so, because uh, there's just yeah. not that much data or exactly. Or, 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 I yeah. mean, uh, we are only uh, persisting the uh, PSQ transaction. All the rest of the tr of the normal yeah. uh, Bitcoin transaction are not persisted. They get yeah. thrown, they only ha held in memory while you're passing for one block. As you always uh, mm -hmm. request uh, that all the transaction for one block. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is uh, no issue. And uh, PSQ, it's hard to estimate how many PSQ transactions there will be and we might run into a scaling issue at some point of time that maybe these local snapshots become me megabytes or even gigabytes someday. Mm -hmm. But I think that's probably two, three years away this problem and we have time mm -hmm. to fix it later. Um, yeah, so so I want to um, see if I have a, a good mental model of uh, high level what you shared with me, right? So we have the, I think we call it BSQ parser, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, it's actually, I'll, I'll sort of zoom all the way out. Uh, so I'm running uh, a seed node. A seed node uh, now encompasses the idea of being a, a, a BSQ full node, right? Uh, no, uh, when you when you're full node, you only need to set up with Bitcoin Core and with this RPC settings, and you don't need the okay, seed good. node for it. The okay, good. Is so, so I'm running. Online. I'm running. 
I'm running BISC desktop locally, right? With all this stuff lit up and my BISC desktop client can at least optionally be a BSQ full node. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so here I am running the BSQ full node. This means that, uh, you know, the moment that I downloaded it, I got whatever the latest snapshot was. Uh, but from there, you know, it's my node's duty, of course, to keep in sync with, uh, uh, with all the SQ transactions. So I fired up for the first time and somewhere in the background on a, on a non uh, user thread, right? BSQ parser gets started and mm -hmm. it's, and it, and it's now uh, requesting blocks from let's in my local Bitcoin core, let's say uh, via normal Bitcoin RPC uh, saying, you know, get the, get the latest, get the latest, headers, get the latest block and it's applying BSQ validation logic to mm -hmm. see are there valid BSQ transactions here. Um, when the answer to that question is no, no information gets stored whatsoever. We simply discard that, but we're updating, you know, the latest known, you know, uh, chain height, right? Block height. Yeah. So, so we know where to start over, but we're recording nothing if there, if there isn't any BSQ exactly, data. Yeah. Okay, so now there's empty blocks basically so when there is a block without a bsq transaction we still right. store the block but uh, it contains zero transactions uh, okay so this bsq block abstraction that you have here get, basically consists of uh the block number right exactly, yeah. and that's it right and then yeah. empty set of bsq transactions exactly as so the bsq block mm -hmm. is very thin it's mainly their uh, transaction list <laughs> And right. only the previous hash, the hash, the time, and the height, the height. Okay, okay, good. And so, so when the when the answer to the question is yes, there are BSQ transactions. Uh, same thing. We now actually we always persist the block, but this time the block has a non-zero list of transactions. So that's that's happening in uh, over time, and when we see. Um, uh, what has not yet become an issuance transaction, right? A compensation request, um, a fee transaction, basically, is that what we're calling it? Yeah, it's a proposal transaction in general and compensation transaction in special when it's a uh, right. So we see a, so we see a proposal transaction, <coughs> and 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 the uh, uh, that of course has not yet been approved by voting. That's going to happen later, different phase. There we are, still parsing, parsing, parsing. We get to that phase. We see per BSQ validation logic, right? You know, we just know that, hey, this is the validation or this is the approval for that original uh, proposal transaction. So now we need to update the state. One way or another, we need to update the state of that proposal transaction so that it's regarded as valid BSQ. It's been sort of like maybe pending BSQ yeah. all this time, right? It's actually not valid BSQ all this time. And now we need to make sure that um, when uh, we go to spend this BSQ from the BIS desktop client or we're validating somebody else's incoming BSQ transaction to us or whatever, we need to know that this is actually valid, right? Uh, so from what I've heard so far, um, I, think, I, I, I think I would echo mo pretty much everything you said. Um, my first instinct would be make all that stuff immutable. Um, just like you said, and just eliminate a whole class of, of problems. Of course, you introduce a new problem, which is uh, what might seem like a less intuitive uh, kind of like um, mutation model, right? The most intuitive thing is go tweak a property on an object. Um, we'd have to do something else other than that. Uh, and then what you said about uh, basically maintaining parallel data structures. Yeah, uh, that's my main concern yeah. with, because yeah, when you have a, a issue there, especially with uh, threading context and this yeah. data structure get out, and I have the same problem in the Bitcoin part. We are, uh, yeah, we are maintaining our own um, uh, database for marking our addresses for, yeah, that's uh, reserved for funding and so on. Uh -huh. And sometimes with bugs or whatever, they, they get out of sync with the real uh, wallet and then you're screwed up. And it's, um, I'm, that's the downside of this approach. And I'm not really sure uh, what's better. Yeah. Well, I think so. There's a sort of like 
in principle and then in practice, right? Or in theory versus in practice here. Uh, basically the execution of this could fuck it all up is what you're saying, right? You could create a situation where there's even more bugs or it's even harder to, to develop and design. So yeah, of course, right? But but like just in theory, the, the idea that you have a parallel data structure that's, you know, keyed by transaction ID or whatever is appropriate. Uh, and that the overall parsing logic is now regarding uh, basically the 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 uh, original data structure that we talked about the 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 BSQ blockchain I guess we're calling it right uh, it, it's it's always checking that in parallel you know or at the same time with with this uh, parallel data structure that says like ah this has actually been updated that's that makes sense, uh, and and I I don't see it as like an overwhelming technical challenge, but yeah, it introduces new mm -hmm. new risks. Um, the the other thing that comes up, and th this isn't a fully fleshed uh, thought, but um, this is why I was asking about the, um, you know, how this is actually persisted, and 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 a bit about what the structure looks like. Um, uh, uh, like ultimately, uh, ultimately the BSQ, can you go to BSQ blockchain? Mm -hmm. There is a data which is sort of mainly the area of the block system. Mainly right. stuff there. It's right. not too much. I mean, uh, this transaction map announcement, transaction output maps is just mm -hmm. like caches or like a utility at the end. Mm -hmm. I think it would not be really needed. The transact Genesis transaction ID and block height. <laughs> and the Genesis transaction itself, but that would also not need. So the only thing what really needed here is the BSQ blockchain, and uh, yeah, that's also marked already in the in the transaction. So you could find it out in the blockchain what yeah. the transaction. And and now this is not this is not protobuf generated code, right? So so when you go to persist this, what do you what exactly do you uh, do? Yeah, that's here in the protobuf. So here, uh, are, here it's converted to a proto message. Uh -huh. and, yeah, in the blockchain, and the other, as so it's uh, yeah, here in the block, you have your message, and then I see. So there's it. there's like mirror image kind of uh, proto buff uh, structures. Yeah, for, so the for, for each one of these, or uh, BSQ block, for instance, it's uh -huh. uh, yeah, it, uh, where's the block itself here? Uh, it, that's the the buffer uh, structure and the transaction and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So, so the reason that I was asking about this is, um, are, are you are you familiar with um, persistent data structures? Have, have you ever heard this this term? Mm, not really. I think, or maybe I can explain it. Maybe. Uh, no way. Yeah. There's like there's there's immutable data structures, right? And you know, you're using some form of immutable list. I see here, right? Um, yeah. That's pretty familiar, but but this idea of persistent data structures um, often often they're called persistent immutable data structures. Is that you have you have a data structure? Um, it can be a tree like structure uh, or a linked list or what have you. That uh, when you make changes to it, uh, a copy essentially a copy yeah. of that data like structure. Exactly. Uh, sorry, like like in like in Acker, or, or that was also another idea to really always uh, create new immutable objects. First, uh, yeah, you're saying in in Akka, like the actor framework, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 because Scala has uh, built in um, uh, persistent collections, if I recall correctly. So, so Akka probably kind of is designed around them. Uh, I, I'm really not sure. But but yeah, you, you sort of get this feeling of, and this is like actually very cheap, you know, sort of copies, uh, you know, it's all done very, very smartly. But um, but this idea of being able to, uh, you know, I have to take this call. Let me just, let me just grab it real quick. Hi, Veronica. Um, yes, just, just one second, okay? So, um, so Manfred, I have to take this, but it'll be about five minutes probably. I'll, I'll yeah. pause. Okay. Sure. Just th was talking about this. This what I know from Akka a little bit that you are always uh, copying. You make basically a deep copy, uh, a cloning from the data structure, and with that, 
even if there are some data which are kind of like Im uh, mutable because yeah, they're, they're null at the beginning or whatever, uh, they can be changed and you have always final uh, uh, fields because uh, they're always all set in the constructor. And I was considering, uh, that, well, mm -hmm. I was just a little bit worried regarding performance because at the moment probably it wouldn't be a problem, but uh, you cannot really, when you find out it's a performance issue that you're copying all the time, the whole BSQ blockchain or really a lot of data, um, yeah, you cannot fix this probably when, I mean, in Scala probably it's, it's more, so better supported in the in the language itself, or but I'm not I'm not so sure if it's if it's a concern or not. About uh, uh, it, it, in my experience, it ends up not being uh, just because of the the nature of how persistent collections work. Like it feels like you're doing that deep copy, but you're actually not. It's just pointers, yeah. right? You're you know you're copying very you're copying very little, often sometimes nothing, right? Other than just the change that you made. And then you have a new branch in a in a in a tree, right? Just in, in the internal data structure that's underneath that persistent list or persistent linked list or or, or a tree that you're building. There's an so internal data structure as well that's just moving pointers around, basically. So there are special Java uh, data types which are supporting this or uh, deep yeah. copying, basically. Because I was I don't want to do it manually. I, I, when I have to make a clone, I do it over protobuf. So I serialize everything to put the buff and then back and then I have a deep copy yeah that costs some time uh, so that's not yeah for sure this is like this is like orders and orders of magnitude cheaper like the, like this is actually extremely high performance uh, these, these yeah. are actually built for performance right yeah. in, in many cases so like p collections is one um, uh, uh, it, it, over the last like five years or so, I think there's been like qu quite a bit of uh, development and innovation. Like people have been bringing over from Scala, from especially from uh, Clojure, right? Um, the Lisp on the JVM. Like like they have the sort of like gold standard persistent collections in Clojure, and so people have been sort of bringing over, importing all the best ideas there. And, and this just, uh, so I don't have a strong design sense, like, oh, it should definitely be designed this way. But like, as we were talking through this and you know, you're, just, you're just dealing with the fact that you need to mutate this, 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 this big data structure, it just, it kind of triggered that persistent yeah. collections conversation. I was, yeah, I was considering, but a main, uh, a main uh, important uh, context, I think, what I have not said yet, is there's only one writing thread. So we don't have the issue that there are different writers and uh, readers mm -hmm. are, are the UI thread and their, and their uh, parser thread itself. <coughs> but only the parser thread is writing the data. <coughs> so I'm not sure if we gain too much here because it's for writing the data uh, that yeah, when we would create a new transaction, <coughs> uh, when any, any property has changed in the transaction, uh yeah but yeah no uh go on uh, your yeah uh, yeah, yeah really just riffing there again i don't have a, a super strong sense of it but um um yeah In, it, so so maybe let's just talk through like what what actually happens now when when a when a transaction is is sort of, you know, mutably uh, changed, right? Like the actual transaction object, you go back and, and you change it and you say, hey, this is now valid BSQ because there was a, an approval of it. Um, yeah. What what sort of happens then? Like you, you, you make that change, what, are listeners notified? Like, like how does that propagate out into the application? Uh, uh, yeah, what happens after you do that? Yeah, yeah. Usually they are listening on a new block, and the new block is created <coughs> or is added to the blockchain after the parsing is complete. <coughs> so after every block, there is basically a, a state change, and <coughs> the UI is listening to this, and then applying it together with the wallet or uh, uh, data or so. <coughs> uh, to, to the UI and then for instance your balance also will be updated and you see okay you have made a transaction it's not confirmed yet so it's not verified so I can show you it maybe a little uh, quickly one second uh, 
So we are only displaying a verified transaction when you make a BSQ transaction to yourself or so. <clears throat> Uh, let me show you then, it's more intuitive for I sent 111 BSQ to myself, so as you see now. Um, uh, actually, here. I can't see. I can only see ah, idea. Sorry, one second. I need to change the screen sharing to full desktop. Now you should see there. Yeah. Yeah, also I have now uh, this amount of BSQ, <coughs> one and a half million. <coughs> I'm sending now, or let's send more, so uh, I'm sending one million, one million BSQ. <coughs> um, as soon as I click the send transaction, I see here now it's an unverified transaction. I only have that left, which were in other outputs, but <coughs> this output, which were taken for spending one million BSQ, is now unverified. So uh -huh. It's not clear that uh, it will be valid PSQ only after the passing of the next block it will right. become valid. Then, in the, yeah, when I create a new block, then it's passed and then uh, it's verified and uh, the balance is updated here. It's clear now this transaction was a self sent transaction. Mm. And, every, so, and this is all triggered by the on a uh, new block, or uh, so when a new block is added, or uh, where we are. No, so the wrong class. Uh, IntelliJ is pretty slow also uh, recently. I think it's really related with this protobuffer issue <coughs> that this class is so huge. <coughs> uh, yeah, here we are notifying all the listeners to they, uh, they get, uh, get updated. But <coughs> before, <coughs> I just wanted to know if you have any, uh, any other special or if you have a very strong opinion about this data structure because I think we are basically on the same page here. We had a the three different variants. The one what I have already, that it's a tree structure uh, with partial mutable data, <coughs> which seems to be the most uh, intuitive and the, <coughs> and the one where you have only one data structure to m maintain. <coughs> uh, but uh, yeah, the data is not really immutable. <coughs> most of the fields are immutable, but not all. <coughs> and then the other two strip it out to extra um, data structures like maps for all the mutable data or to make deep copies at every time when the state is changing. I think this, uh, this are probably the, the uh, which is actually, I think it's, I don't have the feeling that's the right approach here. For instance, when uh, with the issuance, we are rewriting a block then from the past and it, just does not feel right that uh, it, it, that's that's the thing is it feels like like it's yes it's intuitive from a kind of like object oriented programmer's point of view but it doesn't actually map onto the domain that we're modeling exactly yeah. right and i mean probably the best what would map is to strip out all the immutable data to extra data structures like we do it for the utx so Maybe that would fit best to the blockchain paradigm, but, but maybe yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's 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 also like not even because it, it may not even it, there may not even be any any uh, quote mutable data left because if if what's if we picture these two data structures, basically all of the BSQ transactions are sort of valid or not, right? You know, like this pending state or not or whatever. And then there's another uh, uh, data, data structure of some kind that says, oh, an event happened over here that validated this BSQ, right? Well, that doesn't need to be mutable at all. But anything yeah. that's reading that will go like, ah, now this thing is, is, is valid, right? And like everybody in the world should treat this as valid, but it all came from immutable data. Yeah. But there is, I mean, the UTXO, that's uh, what we share with Bitcoin. That's probably in Bitcoin the only mutable yeah. data. <clears throat> but we have more like this, if, it's a, if a transaction is an issuance transaction, uh, I think those are probably the, the, main, the main mutable data which are really get changed for blocks in the past. And in Bitcoin, it's the same. I unspent transaction output first. It's... Uh, <clears throat> it's probably not the uh, field in the blockchain itself because uh, you're <coughs> uh, it's an external field which is uh, yeah, modeled in an extra data structure in Bitcoin probably. <coughs> but, uh, but yeah, maybe we are... I, I would be surprised if 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 it were if 
if UTXOs were like actually modeled in any way as a mutable field in any sort of object or data structure. I, I have no idea in Bitcoin, but I would yeah. be surprised if they were. I would imagine that you're that you're seeing some that you'd see something more like um you, you know, basically you're swapping out the UTXO set that's associated with this with this address or whatever it is, right? Uh, you know, it was this and now something changed and now here's the new version of it, right? That's yeah. that's why the, it, like, I would imagine something like the persistent data structure approach is, is happening there. Um, but, I but, I, think, but I don't know. I, I'm not sure how it exactly works in Bitcoin, but my, what I know or what I think it's that, uh, yeah, they, they keep it as this extra data structure, the UTXO map. And yeah, that's a mutable change with every transaction with every uh, block, and that are uh, persisted as well. <coughs> but that's independent of the blockchain. The blockchain is pure immutable. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And okay. So and m maybe it would be the right approach for us here as well. I'm not hundred percent sure yet, but maybe we have a better picture when we get into because <coughs> at the moment. <coughs> This alone is not uh, any big problem. So I, uh, I have, uh, I have two problems, and one we have not talked at all at the moment. As one is uh, the right uh, threading model. So I'm not sure if these locks, these read-write locks, are really needed. If it's maybe better or easier to make synchronized methods or to put locks on all the objects, what I'm, uh, what I'm accessing. I assume I'm not super familiar with threading, but I'm assume I uh, hope that's correct. Otherwise, uh, probably there would be tons of issues in threading. <clears throat> when I'm, for instance, here when I'm access or when I'm accessing the blocks. Uh, one second. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> this uh, get BSQ blocks. <clears throat> when I'm uh, making a, a read lock on the BSQ blocks. <clears throat> Uh, the the lock is basically uh, applied also to all the sub uh, objects. So uh, when there would be a transaction inside of the block which gets not changed the state from non-issued to issued, uh, <clears throat> that cannot be written in the moment when I have the read lock for uh, for the PSQ block. Uh, is this correct? This assumption that can, the can lock you, is. But this is this this read write lock thing is something that you guys wrote, right? Can you? Uh, no, that. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we have just done this functional style, but it's a reentrant. Uh, ah, I see. I see. I see, I see. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if it's. I was nice. reading up a little bit more afterwards, and I was not sure if it's really requi required for our use case. I left it so far because I, yeah, I was already close to change everything to normal synchronized methods, but uh, it seems that it's a little bit better perf uh, performing because it uh, treats reads and writes differently, and we have. Uh, we have only one write thread and uh, two read threads. So there's, there are basically there's only two two threads: the UI thread and uh, so okay. So so what this thread. what this comes down to is that you don't want to get inconsistent reads, right? Sorry yeah. to use the word right, but just say, you, I'm also just that I have uh, the correct uh, knowledge about how lo locking and so works in Java. So yeah. when uh, let's say I, I require a lock on a transaction and um, you had earlier or on a block and you had already access uh, on a transaction of this block and now you are changing the state of the transaction to an issuance transaction that shouldn't be allowed when I have the lock on the block itself because uh, it goes uh, trans, uh, transiently through all the dependent objects in the block and I can, you cannot write any object in the tree of this uh, root object what I'm locking, is this correct? Right, transitively, uh, not transiently. But, uh, yeah, uh, transitively. Can, um, can you look at the, can you go to the Java doc for re-entry, read, write doc? Mm -hmm. Use all the class level. So, Yeah, maybe do a F1 on it just to render it, make it a little more readable. So, sorry, about that. Like do a click F1 in there to actually show the... Uh, where is this? It, if you just click the like F1 key, it should bring up the... 
Oh shit. Okay, yeah. never mind. It's okay. No, that's error. Has yeah. to be configured differently. Uh, where is it in the? It's like whatever the however you bring up a Java doc pop up window that renders it is yeah. is what I'm talking. I usually about. always read it directly here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, once I'm just I'm just bring maybe you could bring it up in a browser. Yeah, but I just search real quickly. Yeah. Can you go to read write lock? <laughs> so I so, so I so, mm -hmm. as far as I understood it it's uh, it performs better because there can be multiple read uh, readers uh, but as uh, when one has a write lock the readers have to wait and um, how was it for um, when somebody has a read lock, the writer has to wait as well. But yeah. uh, when somebody has a read lock, another reader can read as well. So that, yeah. I think that's yeah, the that, that yeah that that makes sense. Um, but my I I would be surprised if this were um, somehow um, uh, deep, like you're talking about, like 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 traversing through the object graph, like you talk about. Mm -hmm. I that uh, I I would be I would be surprised if that's true, and I would be surprised if that were in any way performance. Um, but uh, uh, I don't. But I don't know that you need it, right? Because if you if you have yeah. if you have a read write lock on whatever your 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 sort of monitor or object is, like in this case, uh, I, it's on it's on the block. Okay. Uh, it depends what I'm accessing. Also, uh, the <clears throat> the read write is <clears throat> on the on the whole blockchain. So uh -huh. that's uh, yeah, that's what there. So basically, you're blocking the whole class. That's when when class. you construct it, you give it you give it the whole blockchain. Uh, yeah. So to here it's the uh, <clears throat> the uh, read write lock created, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> yeah, you make sure in every. Uh, method uh, which is accessing a, a read access or a write access. <coughs> uh, uh -huh. You're using uh, yeah the read or the write uh, lock, and you're locking basically the whole class for. But where do you hand? Where do you hand? Oh, this is the class. This is a BSQ blockchain. I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, for instance, but you but you must be giving that 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 lock class and a kind of object to monitor at some point. I mean, do you hand it um, this at some point? Like, how does no, it know that it's watching this? Uh, I think. Uh, uh, okay, the the the, the read write lock must be internally maintaining this state, so it's not it's yeah. not it's not watching a given object. It's it's no. keeping track of the of the calls to read exactly. and to yeah, write yeah, and to yeah, so on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, okay. So, all right. So, so, uh, so, so, I think we've talked about that. Just like the the nature of that of that um, concurrency mechanism. But, but now, my let's just go back to why we need it, right? So, you're only ever writing single threaded, and yeah. you're and you're reading from what at least two threads. The, the UI uh, yeah, I think there are not there are no other threads which are reading that. I mean, there may be the persistence, but when I'm persisting the data, I make a deep copy of the whole blockchain with protocol. Uh -huh. I'm cloning it. So, so what's I'm what's the it. what's the use case that that sort of necessitates all of this? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I want to avoid. Yeah, I, I I move a little bit the topic now to my main <laughs> problem, what we have not talked about at all, <laughs> which mm -hmm. uh, brings everything together now. Why I uh, want to be sure to have the right data structure and the right threading model, <laughs> and that is, um, we have on the one side this blockchain uh, uh, validation logic, and so which is kind of like simple in a way <laughs> because it's uh, yeah it's happening with every block and so on. It's uh, 
it's very uh, consistent. Uh, but on the other side, we have the peer-to-peer -peer network side. We are getting the data uh, from the network, and that's uh, unreliable. It might be that some data never arrive or whatever. <coughs> it uh, from the timing, or uh, it can arrive when you make a, a um, publish a proposal. It might be that I only see it after two days. So we have to deal with all kind of um, inconsistency issues hit there. And uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, <coughs> and it's executed on the users, right? Because uh, all these uh, callbacks, when we get any data from the peer-to-peer -peer network, I mean, that would be a difference, right, as well. There are multiple threads for all the connections. So every connection would have their own thread, but that's mapped uh, in the, to the user thread. <coughs> So when I have, maybe I show a class where I'm dealing with this, like the blind vote, that's one of the middle. Um, I have so service classes for all those areas. There are the proposals. <coughs> that's the first part where you are publishing the proposals. You are creating a transaction and a peer-to-peer -peer network object and publish this to the network. <coughs> then there is the blind vote where you are uh, voting on your list of proposals. Uh, let's say there are 10 proposals, uh, compensation requests. <coughs> you have received all 10. <coughs> you make the voting on a number of those proposals. And then you are encrypting this list of proposals, including your votes. <coughs> uh, and you are uh, make, create the hash of this uh, encrypted list and create a Bitcoin transaction where you put the hash and up return and publish this to the network with your stake. You're putting whatever the stake what you want to use in an output, <coughs> and then the network can see there is somebody who has voted with this stake on, on their proposals, but nobody knows what you have voted because it's just a hash of the encrypted data. And in parallel, uh, you are publishing your this data structure of the um, encrypted proposals are uh, including the as a proposal includes the vote <coughs> and uh, the, you are publishing this to the network and everybody receives this but nobody can read it because it's encrypted so nobody knows what you have voted at this moment uh, but everybody should receive the data. but there's no guarantee as there's also no guarantee that you have maybe missed one proposal and one proposal you couldn't vote because you never received it as well with the blind votes there might be that some people never receive your message and don't have the full date of you so we have to deal with all this uh, eventually consistency issues and <coughs> when when you receive uh, as a client such a blind vote object from another client yeah, you're storing it locally and when you you're verifying some things uh, like uh, if if you're in the correct uh, phase and in the correct cycle cycle and so on and if there's a, a bitcoin transaction as they are connected when when i would receive a blind vote peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, network object and i don't see any bitcoin transaction which is mapping as in in the blind vote data there is the bitcoin transaction also so it need to match together when there is no bitcoin transaction it's invalid so the blind vote data alone uh, does not work <coughs> um, and at the end, at the, at the issuance, we are we need all this data because yeah, as it, after the blind vote, there is then this reveal transaction. There is no peer-to-peer -peer network data for this. It's only a Bitcoin transaction <coughs> where you are <coughs> where you are <coughs> revealing your secret key, <coughs> and with the secret key, and this transaction is uh, spending the the stake output from the blind vote transaction. When you vote with 10,000 BSQ, <coughs> that's used as the input for the reveal transaction. And then the output is normal BSQ again for you. <coughs> In the meantime, this is blocked, so you cannot spend it. And, uh, <coughs> and you put your secret key into up return. With the secret key, everybody can look up what was, their, uh, what was the blind vote transaction. And uh, with the transaction, they know their peer-to-peer uh, -peer network data object <coughs> and, and decrypt this peer-to-peer -peer network data object and get your list of uh, proposals and see what you have voted on each proposal and then there is another thing but i don't uh, this to get the same uh, the majority of the data view i don't want to get in this because it just makes everything more complicated not very relevant to the main problem <coughs> and yeah and then everybody at 
actually already when they received uh, in the blockchain or when they see in the blockchain the reveal transactions, they could partially already <coughs> create uh, preliminary results. When I have the first result from you, I know what you have voted. When I get the second, I have the collection of two. At, uh, we do it at the moment only at uh, the issuance uh, phase, so at a certain block uh, at the end of the cycle. <coughs> we are... Uh, we are calculating the total result, so there have to be all uh, uh, revealed transaction published, and all, yeah, all the data has to be there, so you can make a total result of all the valid uh, votes and compensation requests and reveal transactions and so. And then you are calculating the total result, <coughs> and then uh, you are updating the Bitcoin blockchain. You are setting this is issuance transaction to a compensation transaction if it uh, has been voted okay <coughs> and yeah that's it basically and <coughs> and here i have a little bit this uh, uh this clash of two worlds of the one side the bitcoin or uh, yeah this event stream domain or uh, model where you have uh, <coughs> a mutable data structure which change with every block and um and you can rebuild the whole data structure with starting from scratch again. When you're reiterating from block zero, you get exactly the same state al always. <clears throat> and then we have this uh, data structure from the peer-to-peer -peer network where I receive a, <clears throat> a blind vote and then I collect it in a normal list and consistently. <clears throat> and I need to use then this list for getting out the rich data because in the blockchain we cannot put in the whole data structure of your votes and so on that that was the earlier uh, <coughs> approach or that we are we are encoding this in the op return but that was very limited and problematic <coughs> and uh, the current approach is much better at the end but we have to sync those two worlds together the peer-to-peer -to -peer sure. network world with very different properties and the bitcoin world <coughs> at the moment i I have it that way that <coughs> all those services are <coughs> are maintaining a list like here in the blind vote service I have a list of blind votes that get persisted <coughs> and um, I would like I'm, I mean it basically works I, I don't have big problems at the moment I just have the feeling that it's a dangerous uh, <coughs> situation was set up at the moment because here I'm in the user thread on the blockchain side, I'm on this parser thread, so it's a, we are in a different state of the whole application. Basically, the parser thread can be ahead, <coughs> and uh, we are maintaining different data structures. So my current approach is to uh, add an extension to uh, the uh, Bitcoin uh, to the BSQ blockchain, <coughs> uh, either in on the level where it's really required, probably on the transaction level, that every transaction has kind of like an extension, and in the extension will be data like uh, <coughs> the blind vote, <coughs> because they have already this in the transaction type. Uh, so when it's a blind vote transaction, the transaction type is blind vote. When it's a compensation request transaction, it's set by this. So we have this information already encoded, with uh, uh, yeah, we are the type, <coughs> uh, but at the moment we are maintaining the the data structure for the rich data content <coughs> for the proposals and the blind votes. Or uh, we are maintaining it uh, differently on the service level on the user thread. <coughs> and I'm yeah, my current uh, approach would be to move this over to the uh, blockchain data structure. Another reason is that for persisting uh, as with the snapshots, <coughs> uh, we are yeah, we are persisting the whole state. And when we are shipping after two years or so, we are shipping all the history. You don't need to run, rerun everything. Uh, <coughs> at the moment, we, we are also persisting all those peer-to-peer uh, -peer network data. <coughs> so they get our a little bit similar like their uh, trade statistic data, but um, in th that case, this data is also verified by your uh, signature and so on, so nobody can change it. <coughs> and um, yeah, we are persisting this to disk, so when you make a compensation request, everybody is storing this to disk locally, and when you're a new user, you're requesting this from the seed node and get all this data. 
and it basically it should stay in sync. So when or after a year or so, the state the structure will also grow and you get uh, thousands of requests and so on from the seed node delivered or it's uh, also shipped in code as it, uh, we are shipping this in resource files. <coughs> uh, but again, we have, we have this problem that we have our parallel data structure which need to match together and when there is any fuck up, yeah, you are screwed. <coughs> So I think it would be more safe to move this data directly in the blockchain structure <coughs> and like this extension. And something similar, I think, is used in Bitcoin. And that was a problemistic when I designed their wallet stuff in Bitcoin, uh, in BISC, that I use my parallel data structure. And I really uh, re um, was really uh, a mistake to do it. I've uh, regretted that uh, many times already. <coughs> And uh, later I've seen in the wallet, in the uh, Bitcoin J wallet, there is something like extensions and you could add extra protobuf encoded data there. But I have not looked close in this time. I was not really aware. And I think it would have been better to <coughs> encode <coughs> the data what we need for our this extra context, what we want to store with, with the wallet uh, to, to use the, um, the Bitcoin wallet in, instead of our local database file. In a simple case, just where when you have a crash and one file gets persisted and the other not, then you're already out of sync. And we have, uh, from time to time, there are bugs in that area. And I would like to avoid it here, um, that we are running into the same problem zone. Or, and as my current approach would be to move this all to the, to the blockchain data, which shouldn't be a big problem. <coughs> But then I, I started already in a branch <coughs> working on this uh, approach, but I, my head is still not very clear about the threading model. Then, then I would have a blockchain a created a blockchain service class, which is basically maintaining um, the two different uh, uh, sources for the data. On the one side, you get from the parser a new block. <coughs> And on the other side, you get from the peer-to-peer -peer network a proposal, for instance, and then you want to write this proposal in the right transaction, the right block. Mm -hmm. And that's happening on the user thread. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just okay to use some locking mechanisms there as well. And, and it's, a, it's a very different timing. Also, it can be that you receive a transaction for a proposal, mm -hmm. but you never received the peer-to-peer -peer network data. It can be that you received the peer-to-peer -peer network data later or earlier. You have to deal with all this. Or situations and but it's basically not a big problem you just uh, <coughs> deal with it when you have the data you are putting it in this in this um, data node and uh, and yeah you have to deal with uh, threading that you you accessing or <coughs> the psq blockchain either from the parser uh, thread or from the user thread when it comes from the peer-to-peer -peer network so that's that's now the full picture of our, mm -hmm. <laughs> which brings the threading and the basic data structure of the BSQ blockchain together. Uh, yeah, in the full context. <clears throat> What's your uh, opinion about about both? Mm. Well, or maybe <clears throat> I'm not hundred percent sure if it's the right approach. If it's maybe better to keep it really. Are in this separate, like it is now, in the separate database uh, uh, objects, and maybe it's not a practical problem because you can always re-request the data when you're missing anything. There's high redundancy, <coughs> and uh, also I think past. It's only relevant probably for one cycle because the past are. <coughs> is always already written in the BSQ blockchain by when it's the flag is set is issued, you are yeah, you are believing in, in a snapshot, you are not re-evaluating this. <coughs> so are all the past proposals and blind uh, votes are irrelevant to you anyway, <coughs> as long as you are not doing a full uh, re-evaluation. So maybe maybe it's not a real big problem, but I have the feeling it's a dangerous setup uh, where we have uh, data synchronization issues and threading issues <coughs> status synchronization by maintaining different data structures which should not get out of sync and the threat yeah and the th in the current model <coughs> where i'm i've basically i have two kind of like validation modes one is in the in the bitcoin uh, block or uh, parsing world where every yeah you're 
doing all the validation there. <clears throat> But that's not enough for finding out if you uh, want to make an issuance, you need the peer-to-peer -peer network data because the vote, the content of the vote is not delivered in the blockchain, it's only delivered in the peer-to-peer -peer network data. And for that, uh, and that's done in this um, service classes in user thread. And <clears throat> I'm not sure if there are big issues. I mean, one open issue where with this blockchain hate height uh, where I get out of sync because I was just accessing the current uh, height from the blockchain which was sometimes ahead of my user thread but I mean that's fixed at the moment I'm not sure if there are other open issues but I have a little bit of feeling that it's dangerous when uh, you are in this validation code in the service on the user thread you are assuming that uh, the blockchain is basically in sync with you but that it's not true that blockchain can be already ahead in a different state like, like you are and I have a feeling it's uh, not a good uh, setup. Mm -hmm. Just try to try to boil it down and, and, and repeat to you uh, so, I, so I make sure we're on the same page. Uh, what we saw for the first part of this call was, was basically um, there's really only one right thread with regard to the parser, and then you have you're you're possibly reading from a from a couple of threads uh, the, from the user thread all things in the UI, um, and and sorry what what's the second context that you're reading in second thread in context uh, you're it's in? basically only the parser and, and the UI <laughs> yeah okay so 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 basically yeah. like the, the first part of the call was kind of had me going like do we actually do we actually need any you know, synchronization, sort of concurrency management here at all. Um, like I was going to sort of d dig into that a bit, but now I see, right, uh, again, I'm going to try to like paraphrase what you just said, which is that uh, it's about correlating uh, data from two very different sources, right? There's the Bitcoin blockchain that has, you know, possibly BSQ transactions happening on it. Parser is watching that stuff and writing to this to this bsq blockchain data structure as it goes that's the parser thread and then we've got data coming in from the peer-to-peer -peer network which contains what you were calling the rich data about let's say a voting transaction uh, uh basically all the details that are behind the hash that is sitting in the actual bitcoin transaction and we need to link that up um depending on the transaction type and so on but like if it's this blind voting uh, or a voting transaction in general, like we need to say, okay, yeah, we got this voting transaction on the Bitcoin side, and all it has is a hash, but here's the actual data, right? And and there's like state to be updated when when we get that, which is going to be like quite disjoint, probably it could be seconds or minutes or much 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 later, that uh, the eventually the data comes in from the peer to peer network that kind of marries up with what we got from the blockchain. So. Uh, so now we have two pretty distinct, well, very distinct writing contexts. There's the parser context that's writing, and there's the data coming in from the from the peer to peer network that ultimately needs to mutate yeah. the state of stuff too, right? I think actually that's the only case what I'm aware of where the user thread is doing writing on the BSQ blockchain. <laughs> that's issuance. Also, uh, in the user thread, you are evaluating everything, <clears throat> and there you are you are setting the issuance flag on a on a transaction i think uh maybe that could be moved to the parser uh thread <coughs> i started this already uh in my my news uh, uh, for, uh branch <coughs> that um uh, that you are that you are starting you're basically uh, you're listening on this uh on new block handler which is uh, at the moment mapped to the user thread by added another listener which is not mapped to the user thread <coughs> which is in the same thread so you would get called it from the parser thread and then everything what's happening there where you also when you get the new block and the new block is an issuance uh, uh, is, is, is in the issuance uh, phase <coughs> then you do the whole calculation of uh, the voting results and you are setting the issuance state and that would be then in the parser thread that's not in the current version, but uh, that's not a big change and would be easy basically. So uh, this problem could be fixed as well. So then it's again, 
that only the parser's right is writing to the BSQ blockchain. And the UI I don't care much because yeah, that's just visible stuff. And when it's something is delayed, yeah, you get an update a little bit later. <clears throat> the problematic thing is in the validation of the service classes, where the service classes are reading from the blockchain, and it has to be sure that it's, in the, it's really in the right uh, context in the right block, and uh, that it's not out of sync with what the BSQ blockchain is already. For instance, it might be that <clears throat> you are in an older block state and I'm passing your uh, re uh, your blind vote transaction. I mean, uh, probably I'm not aware if there is a realistic case, uh, just model a theoretical case which cannot happen, mm -hmm. but it could be that you are spending in a new block, you are spending the output from your blind vote, so it becomes in illegal, uh, invalid because yeah, you cannot spend it uh, otherwise than for the reveal transaction. When you would have spent it already, <coughs> then your reveal transaction would be invalid. I'm on the old block where it's still unspent, so I consider it valid. I'm doing some other stuff, and yeah, I'm in the, on the right page at, at the moment, uh, at the end. <clears throat> it's not an issue because I'm doing this stuff after a break, and uh, it's triggered by the on new block, so I think it cannot happen, but there might be other hidden uh, issues like this, and I'm would prefer to have it safe from the data structure and uh, model instead of uh, relying that all the sequence is really only executing in a correct way and there cannot be incorrect access or uh, yeah, it would be much stronger when it when it's already on a deeper level or uh, consistent <coughs> I want to make sure I understood that 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 case that you just laid out which was uh, so let's say I uh, have done an, an issuance transaction, uh, and 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 then and then there's going to be a bunch of votes on that, right? Uh, you are you know separate separate clients, etc. You uh, are in some sort of context where you're uh, uh, validating. Um, the BSQ that I used for that issuance transaction, or can you just can you give me the use case again? Yeah, it was a stupid use case because it's but, it, it but it's still happen. like I know it might be implausible, but it's okay. Like like yeah, maybe anything I, concrete I, is helpful. Uh, realistic. The problem what I had was with the block uh, uh, height. Uh, yeah. That uh, I was or uh, I, I I was doing these checks uh, in the service classes. Uh, I was doing this check if this is in the right uh, phase and if it's in the right uh, cycle. And I was uh, accessing directly from the BSQ blockchain the tip of the height. Mm -hmm. And I was not aware that uh, because it's another thread, it was already ahead. So I was basically getting, let's say, uh, on the user thread, you are still behind, you are on block 500, and the parser thread is already on 505, and you are... <coughs> You want to check if this uh, proposal, what you just get, is really in the proposal phase. You're requesting what's the latest uh, the, the chain height, mm -hmm. height, and uh, you are receiving 505. And then you say, no, that's invalid uh, data because uh, it should be 500 uh, or something like this. And <clears throat> that was easy to solve because on this on new block, I get the new block and then I can uh, take the height out of this new block and then I use this instead of looking up the BSQ blockchain and getting uh, eventually new uh, value for this. <clears throat> but it illustrates the, um, the main problem that, uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, as another solution would be that I'm cloning the whole BSQ blockchain when I get this update on the, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> when I get this event handler called on new block <clears throat> that I make a, a, a a clone also from the bsq blockchain when i'm calling these listeners or uh, on block edit <coughs> that mm -hmm. i i pass over my current state of the bsq blockchain i make a deep copy and uh, giving the clients the current state i think then everything should be fine because and then the <coughs> the clients only work access this uh, clone and there are no threading issue because on this clone uh, nobody will write any uh, uh, never and yeah, you're always correct. So even if the client is behind, doesn't matter because it was in this time 
when the parser was on on block 500, uh, it passed it over that state, and then there, um, on the user thread, it executes this state, and later on 505, it gets an adapted and uh, doing the right thing. So that might be a way how to solve this pretty safe. That actually you never you remove all this read access. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. another background, I maybe I've seen this, I have added this readable PSQ blockchain and writable PSQ blockchain, which is kind of like ugly and I will remove this someday. It was just for me to make it more explicit uh, who are the readers and who, who are the writers and mm -hmm. to have better control. <clears throat> and, <coughs> uh, and as the writers are the critical area, I can spot it better, but uh, I will, I'm not happy with this, it will not stick. <coughs> But uh, yeah, uh, okay. So so let's go back to the use case uh, because I like the I like the direction you're headed there. But let's go back to the use case. So uh, this the parser is uh, currently at uh, block height five hundred, right? You on the on the uh, on the user thread, I guess it is. But like you're receiving new data from the peer to peer network saying uh here's uh, w w what exactly is the example the, the, for block height 505 but what did you get from the network uh for instance the reveal transaction uh the, okay. the reveal data also for the reveal right. um, yeah or the compensation request <clears throat> and i need to check if it's in the correct uh height and current uh, yeah if it's the current cycle and the current phase <clears throat> okay so so you so you get from the peer-to-peer -peer network a reveal transaction that says this is this is the uh, uh, reveal data for 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 a for a issuance transaction that happened at block height five hundred five. Uh, uh, I'm looking so, up so <coughs> in the peer. -to -peer sorry, sorry, not for an issuance transaction, but for but for a voting transaction. Yeah. Also, in in the peer to peer network data, there is the transaction ID. Yeah. With the transaction ID, I'm looking up in the PSQ blockchain. Right. What was the height as a property in the in the in the <coughs> transaction is the the block height, and yeah. with uh, yeah I, I get this and then I I'm comparing with I want want to know I know this transaction happened at block 500 now I'm on block 510 and I want to check is 510 still the same phase if it's is it the correct uh, the co correct phase because yeah. when I receive. Uh, when you uh, make a, PSQ, uh, a compensation yeah. request after the phase yes. and publish it, it's yes. invalid, and I yes. need to take this. Got it. Got yeah. it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Good. Yes, that makes sense. So, so it, it, I'm just going to say it again. So, the peer, data that you get from the peer-to-peer -peer network is a reveal transaction. It it's a, it it has a transaction ID, right? Bitcoin transaction ID, BSQ transaction ID. And and it says uh, this happened at also in the peer-to-peer -peer data says no wait no 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 wait no it just has a transaction ID you then go ask the blockchain yeah. what was the block height of this transaction and it says five oh five right yeah. and then you and then you say what block height are we at now and it says five ten right and then and then you're doing the validation math that says okay we're still within the voting phase exactly right. Okay, and 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 the 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 an unhappy path use case that you're talking about here is that you get essentially inconsistent data from that query to the blockchain. It says what's the current block height, and it gives yeah. you uh, five five oh six. It gives you when it's actually five ten, like like it gives you information that makes you think that you're still in the in the voting period. When actually you're not. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, wait. That's bu bu bum. <clears throat> no, it's <clears throat> it's a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> this validation get triggered by uh, on new block, <clears throat> and uh -huh. uh, when you get a new block or. <clears throat> You are checking if this peer-to-peer uh, -peer network data. Um, let me think of one second more. Uh, 
I'll just be, I'll just be I, right I'm, back. That's it. Uh, yeah. Just one second. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> also, I was wondering if I need these checks at all, but I need it, for instance, for a UI. <clears throat> when you you want to see, uh, I show it maybe easier to. Yeah, sorry, I have to get my door open one sec. Hey. Uh, Sorry, Manfred, hang on. I have to actually uh, get, get my door now. I'm just going to put you on pause. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Manfred, I'm back. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I'll show you two use cases where you see uh, why it's relevant to, be, to know if you're in the right cycle and phase. So the active proposals, for instance, they're only active when it's in the right phase in the current cycle. Otherwise, they're in closed proposals. <coughs> And when you start up, uh, when I start up here, I don't have a snapshot, so I'm starting from the genesis and doing everything. I don't know if you will see it uh, in the screen sharing because it's flickering probably too too fast. But you can see that it's, I do see yeah, it, it was changing quickly. <laughs> Sorry? I do see the data like rapidly updating in the screen. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Yeah, the same here is in the transaction view. Yeah. So those are all my transactions that I've done from the genesis up. When I restart it, it starts again with the genesis, and you will see how the list is building up and how the compensation requests are changing to issuance transactions. So, yeah, I don't know if you've seen it, but before it was another symbol, and uh, then it's issuance. Yeah. So uh, during all this process, uh, every time when you get a new block, you're updating the whole state of the application, what's valid, what's not valid. And for that, I need to know always or if I'm in the right or uh, block uh, height. Height, I always confuse this. <laughs> Turn it into my brain. <laughs> and uh, as I said, that's already solved because that was more or less trivial. I'm just a little bit concerned that there will be more issues like this <clears throat> and I would like to get the data structure and the threading model as yeah. solid as possible that to avoid that it can happen at, at all. <clears throat> So at and, the moment, my, go ahead. Yeah, my <laughs> preferred approaches would be to, to move all relevant peer-to-peer -peer network data to the blockchain, to write it in such extension. To the BSQ blockchain. Yeah, to the BSQ blockchain, as in the, in the transactions, basically. And they are already there in a way with transaction type. It's just missing the rich data. Mm -hmm. And to basically write when I get the uh, blind vote and the encrypted, there, the encrypted data are there. And after the reveal, I can decrypt it. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to add it to this data <coughs> structure and to add an extra uh, callback for on block edit, <coughs> which is on the same thread. So all those services are living on the same thread and when they are writing is, uh, the is, issuance uh, flag, it's, uh, we don't have a threading issue again because uh, it's happening on the parser thread. It's triggered from the parser thread at the end of mm -hmm. parsing of a block uh, as an extension. It validates uh, the 
issuance and when the issuance were correct it was writing the flag um what what do you think or or do you do you think it's there are better approaches or other approaches which should be considered <coughs> um yeah i mean of course it's really hard for me to say um uh just catching up here but um i think the mm, basically i basically i wish i i wish i had a, a bit you know better deeper um model of of everything happening here i think i think i've fairly well kept up but but there's nothing like uh having you know been coding on it for weeks and weeks to for, <laughs> to have a better mental model, right? So with all that said, like, I, I think, I think if you can, it seems to me like, like this, this, this read, write, lock approach, you might be able to avoid it completely. Um, mm. Like I think you're saying. Well, what would be the alternative? Because some are threading mechanism, I think is required. I'm not sure. Uh, because I mean, the only critical reader is this uh, services which are doing validation as well. And when this moves to the to the same thread, to the yeah. parser thread, then probably we don't have any. I mean, about the UI uh, uh, thread reading stuff for displaying data, I don't care much when that's a little bit out of sync. It get updated later. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't really cause a problem. I hope. Or do you see? Uh, or would what would you recommend to? move to some more simple threading stuff like like synchronized methods or remove it completely no i guess no i guess it's just that i'm i'm still not seeing what the what the uh what what the the, the use case is for concurrency control like what i just heard you saying was getting to this place where you've got all of the writes happening on the same thread uh and uh and the, the worst case scenario with a with a with a read is that you've uh, is that you 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 read uh, and you've got a little bit you know inconsistent data, but uh, you know because of, because you're uh, intersecting with a write that hasn't finished yet or something like that. But but yeah, again, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing it. Yeah, I'm also. <coughs> uh, I mean, uh, to play extra safe, even if it might not be needed, at least for the uh, for the for the time at the moment. <clears throat> uh, do you see any problem with it? I mean, I don't think we can get to a to a, a deadlock or so, especially when there's only one write thread. <clears throat> uh, like we have it now, I mean, we can be sure that the reader is uh, not interfering during a, a write. Probably it's not needed. <clears throat> But to leave it for now, do you think it, it hurts anything? To leave all the uh, read write lock stuff. In yeah, place. at least well, for now. I, mean, I just I think, think it hurts from it. Just hurts your head, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, but I mean, I'll just I'll just give like broad stroke kind of you know every, try to sum up everything that I've seen here um, for, for whatever it's worth is like yeah I mean the you know classic feedback is um you know uh just avoid concurrency like the fucking plague that it is <laughs> if you possibly can never introduce synchronization or anything about concurrency just design it out be immutable yeah. everywhere right it's all like a little bit kind of you know cliches but i mean and it sounds like you've been thinking about it but it's like vitally important to to design that out if you possibly can uh, the second thing is, um, I think the persistence approach really, really matters here. Um, if, if from no other reason than a, than a complexity point of view, and I think that um, if so, let me put it this way: I don't. Th there's not necessarily a problem with doing everything pr proto buff wise. Obviously, you're making it work. We've made everything else work that way. Um, I think there is. Uh, 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 I don't. I don't know. It seems like it seems like a super painful sort of programming model to do to do everything that way. I understand that some stuff has to go across the wire. I don't know what per 
per percentage of the stuff that you're yeah, I think I, I, probably 90 or even more percent there. Okay. I'm not okay. aware if there even any data which are only uh, stored locally and never okay. stored with the, so uh, even that domain everything basically. Yeah. So even if it's even if it ends up being 100% um, of the stuff that gets persisted locally also goes over the wire. Uh, I think that if I had been designing this from scratch, I would have I would have started by thinking about persisting something like you know blockchain data in just the leanest possible format imaginable. I would have wanted to do um, you know tree structure like map of map structures uh, with just with just bare bones uh, you know raw data um, probably into something like. Uh, level db just super efficient which i don't know what the tr transactionality you know kind of stuff in level db is like but you could probably delegate a lot of this read write stuff uh just down to the level of of, a, of an embedded database like that um you might be able to let it do a lot of the work for you but i would uh, again all just gut instinct stuff right is that is that i would want to cleanly separate the like basically what is protobuf good for and deal with the translation of this underlying tree structure to uh, my own objects, to my protobuf objects. I would just want to have those all in cleanly separated layers uh, where I'm not dependent on this one. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sort of like overloading protobuf um, because maybe it's like sort of convenience are already there. Like, like that would have definitely been a concern for me. Is to just to just do the like the the, the simplest, cleanest, leanest thing possible with the data itself, and that's where the persistent data structures would have come in as well. I think like a combination of writing this data to disk um, in something like Level DB, maintaining it in memory as like a map of maps. You might have abstractions on top of, but ultimately it's just like really low level data structure that, that you can then model in persistent data structures where you can do this, you know, these super cheap, um, you know, copies. They're not actually copies, but they're like, you know, super, super cheap clones and, and, and you can just never, ever, ever worry about consistency issues or threading issues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, my main, my main, or, uh, hmm. I'm still not really bought in because we are doing something which is uh, not typically in, in Bitcoin that we are rewriting a past block with this. Uh, when we would make a, such a, a deep copy of of an old block when uh, ish, uh, issuance transaction, uh, uh, compensation request transaction happened at issuance time or a few hundred blocks later, so it will be changed and then we would basically rewrite the whole block by this just doesn't feel right i mean uh, probably it would lead them to have completely to have a pure immutable data or so basically then a clone from their uh, uh, blocks what we get from uh, rpc they are only containing the pure bitcoin data we are just filtering the the data what we get from the bitcoin blockchain and have uh, only the bitcoin relevant data there uh, transactions there and then maintaining different data structures for uh, is issuance if is an issuance transaction or if it's spent or unspent and so on. Yeah. But then I have a little bit my concern yeah, to sync this this state. I mean, of course, when there is a persistence or data structure which does this all correctly, maybe it's a non-problem. <clears throat> maybe my main problem comes that. Uh, like in the wallet, there are different files, basically. There's this uh, address entry uh, database file, protobuffer collection, and then there is the wallet itself, and when they're out of sync, everything is screwed up. <coughs> and uh, we could put it here, also without uh, any database, we could put it in one <coughs> protobuffer file, <coughs> which contains then all these maps. So the um, maps are quite a pain in protobuffer and so on, but uh, somehow it would work to model it that way. <coughs> yeah. Uh, um, I'm, I'm still not completely bought by this approach. Maybe, maybe it's better uh, to think more about it. Yeah. I, so I actually, I have to run now and prepare dinner. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, and I'll, this will kind of be running in a background thread for me too. I mean, maybe maybe I'll have other thoughts as we go. But I mean, sort of just practically speaking, how much of this is uh, actually on the table? Like, how much you know? What 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 level of change are you sort of willing to consider making here? Uh, so I, I want to get it right. It's too important to be to make compromises just because it takes another few days. And uh, when I'm convinced that changing the data model to a flat hierarchy, I will do it. And I'm not so convinced from using like something like level DB. I'm not experienced at all. And it would, I mean, that's a minor, that's not a problem for me to, also, when I can persist everything, I would like to avoid to have several files for persisting. I would like to have one file and either one file get written or not. So, uh, and if it's protobuffer, uh, primitive uh, data structure, what we have now, if it's a database, that doesn't solve any problem for me and performance is not an issue in that area. We are not writing and reading from disk all the time, only at the snapshot once a day or whatever. So that's basically... A, <laughs> and that can be added any time later. It's, that's the persistence. I mean, the whole persistence in BISC should be moved maybe to a database someday, but that's kind of like independent of, <laughs> of the main domain here. Uh, my main problem is to have these different worlds, the Bitcoin world with its own paradigms and the peer-to-peer -peer network world. <laughs> and I have to do validation on both sides and merge this data together into one model and, uh, and connect it a little bit to threading which is probably not so hard to solve. And I'm, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, you know, I, I wish I had a, a, a former colleague of mine here. Uh, I won't mention his name just because we're still recording, but, um, but I worked with someone recently who I've, I've thought a lot about during this conversation. He's not a Bitcoin expert at all, but, uh, but much of the stuff that we talked about here reminds me a lot of, of, uh, of him. And I, I've been meaning to reach out to him actually. Uh, I have somehow a sneaking suspicion that he might be interested in, yeah. uh, in, 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 uh, in moving. And it would be, so this is like a total long shot. Uh, we'll see if it works out, but, but if, if he happened to be interested uh, in, in doing something with us, it would be an interesting like, conversation to have to, to, to catch him up on this. And, uh, yeah, it would be great. I mean, I just I have to solve this more or less in the next days or weeks because I don't yeah. want to uh, yeah. block this. <clears throat> and I, then after, when, it's, when, I'm, when I uh, have everything in a good shape, I want to start with tests and make it really bulletproof and yeah. uh, try to break it and all this. And after this, I don't want to make re, uh, big refactorings because then you have to uh, a lot of effort with the tests and everything to adopt this. And yeah. I want to get then the UI finished. And so, uh, so it's basically for me to scope more or less. I think in one week, I'm kind of like, like ready, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> that I, from my side, I feel that it's, it's uh, solid. Yeah. And after this, I, um, I would be, I mean, of course, when somebody come up with a much better idea uh, and uh, convinced that I will, I will change it, but I w would try to avoid it otherwise and never get finished. Yeah. <laughs> but if you can get him the next day or so or as soon as possible, I was also uh, wondering because, I mean, even for people who are not uh, familiar with blockchain, I think this uh, concept from another friend who is a big uh, Scala fan and developer, Yeah. He, uh, <laughs> and he was a little bit in, involved at the very beginning also. Uh, he was super surprised that basically Bitcoin, are also, yeah, on the Scala world, also, you know, I think it's called event stream or that you have basically just a list of events and the events are updating your, your state and you always can replay all the events and always get to the same state, the same yeah. like a gym basically. And I'm using, that's another interesting element for these parts where we are... Uh, <clears throat> where we are changing parameters like the fees or like we can even change the durations of the phases or that will be more complex, but should be supported as well. <clears throat> we are <clears throat> storing the values or uh, yeah, we, I model it also as a list of change events yeah. <clears throat> and uh, at which blockchain they get triggered from this moment on the new value after the issuance or after the validation when it has been 
are <laughs> verified that was voted okay, the new the new value will be applied. Like for yeah. the voting fee or so, we start with whatever five BSQ at the beginning. Maybe in uh, one month we change it to ten BSQ, and then after this issuance trans uh, block the new value will be applied and when there would be a fee with the old value it would be invalid so and that's yeah that's a kind of like a, a stream of events which get executed at every block and updating the state and i think people from this color world and so on they are familiar with these models and have yeah. similar issues i think one which is a little bit different i don't think that we have performance and scaling issues at least at the moment and are, I mean, they are very often designed about big data and have completely different requirements. Or for us, it's uh, security and consistency that we are avoiding any source of inconsistency in the data model. That's yeah. I think the most important thing. Yes, and that and that it's ultimately possible for every node to be fully validating, right? Yeah, shipping these snapshots is nice, but like it's pretty important that and it, it sounds like you've you know, really been keeping this in mind, but I mean, it has to be designed such that somebody can boot up. Yeah. Scratch, right? uh, yeah. So that's uh, completely by design. It just, I know from convenience, people don't want to do it. And so yeah. we have to support yeah. it, <laughs> but it's not but really modeling a things as, as, as an event log, right. You know, it, uh, the replay is, you know, yeah. you, also, you, you never depend on the snapshot. It's just, it will be there and we need to support it and uh, think with this in mind, but you always can start from the genesis and have to yeah. end up with exactly the same <coughs> uh, data like exactly. Uh, like it's there. Yeah. And that actually bring a little bit. Hmm. I mean, actually, yeah, we, we are a little bit relying <coughs> that somebody, the seed nodes, that there is some source of the, all the history of all the peer-to-peer -peer network data because you will need it when you're replaying it, uh, all, the, yeah, all this data. Mm. <coughs> and at the moment, it's not super relevant in this because not the security issue. Uh, with here now, we are adding, so, and basically that's another reason why I think it's better to really model it to this, uh, BS to one data object to the BSQ blockchain, which get persisted and chipped and not have several data objects because it's then it's then basically our local private blockchain. We are using the Bitcoin blockchain as well, but yeah. additionally, it requires that we have our blockchain and there have to be enough copies out that you always get this blockchain data, which contains all the peer-to-peer -peer network uh, data otherwise you will not be able to get to the same result when all the peer-to-peer -peer network data or some of those data will be lost yeah. and you can't recover then you will end up in a different stand uh, state uh, state at the end some that's right will not be valid and so on and you have a lot of conflict so that that's right. we have to be very aware of this that we have to have a very redundant storage of this uh probably we need much more seed nodes or much more people who are maintaining this or uh, this blockchain and keeping this or uh, that it cannot happen that uh, there is no copy of this old peer-to-peer -peer network yeah data out there. Know, it's interesting right it's 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 no different for bitcoin no yeah when it's, when everybody would lose the blockchain exactly. yeah I mean, yeah, this is now just exceedingly unlikely that that would happen, but yeah. um, but it's really the yeah. exact same thing. You have to have a peer-to-peer -peer yeah. network. Where I mean, some altcoins, some ba baby altcoins uh, where there were just 20 people running it. It's happened probably that nobody has the data anymore and you, yeah, you can. That's right. That is one way that a blockchain can die, <laughs> is the last yeah. copy that it can, can yeah. die. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Very interesting. I'm, I'm super glad we did this. I was looking forward to it. I mean, it's really been... Interesting to see how all this is working. So, I mean, if you have time already, it's already now in a pretty good shape. But I don't have, beside this, what we discussed, yeah. I, I mean, the services are all kind of like nicely reflected in my branch. It's not in the master. Uh, but if you have time, I would happen, you'd be happy to get. But I don't want to block you too early. And I would like to get a deep review when I feel I'm ready for a review and it's still not yeah. there. But anytime when you're too curious or so, and you find some time, uh, you'd be welcome. Yeah. Uh, let Let me see if my Let me see if my friend is interested in in, in doing a in doing a, a session with us. I think we could do another sort of two hours. 
yeah, it would be great. And, uh, I, I, bet, I, also I bet you have some interesting insights. Try to reach out to the other friend to what I mentioned before, because yeah. uh, that's also his domain. And uh, maybe I'm pretty sure I know already what he will tell me. Uh, like, like I had earlier discussions, like, yeah, like copying and avoid state and everything immutable. And yeah. so <clears throat> I'm just not, I'm, I don't know about this uh, persistent data structures where you get cheap copies because otherwise doing deep copies uh, like I do now with protobuffer, I feel it's a little bit too expensive when the blockchain is really big. It really, it really took me a while to get my head around it. And, and part of the issue is here that I, I still don't have like true mastery of, of all the, um, uh, really of all the way things work. Uh, I was actually with the same friend, like he really educated me about persistent uh, data structures and it's, it, it's just one of those things that you have to spend some time with and then you go like, oh my God, this is the way everything should work all the time, right? Uh, it's just like a better way, <laughs> simply. And, uh, and it's just different than the way like, you know, the collections work in Java and so on. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sold on, 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 on the idea that, that, that it's very high performance. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, you, it's not the sort of thing you want to just come along and just drop in, right? You want to have like this overall vision and I can sort of see the, the edges of it. And we've talked about the different components here. I mean, I see, I mean, you, I think you have to really design it maybe with your own framework like Acker or so that you really think in a, on a like in network programming. Yeah. You, you never have a shared state. You always get messages and you're copying to your, <clears throat> when you get a new message. Yeah. Because <clears throat> when you mix it, you are, I would send a copy of my blockchain to their, uh, to, yeah, to their, to the services. They are doing some uh, updates of the state, and then basically you need to get it back to the main block, uh, to the BSQ blockchain, and apply these changes to your. And when your local uh, copy would have changed as well, yeah, which one is the right one? It can be that there, it cannot be probably some use case I have, but theoretically could be that the parser is changing the BSQ blockchain and the services are changing the BSQ blockchain. They are done. They are sending maybe back their same copy and then you need to merge both and yeah, oh, maybe you have like merge conflicts. And yeah. Um, yeah. Look, I, I have to run. Um, yeah, sure. But, uh, but th th that'll be the next thing I'll do here is I'll just reach out to my friends, see if it works. I, I, I probably won't get back to it otherwise um, uh, until maybe we do a more dedicated review or, or you're, you're ready. But just, just so you know, like I, not only I have um, my normal list of stuff with this, but I have some personal stuff I have to take care of this week too. So, so I'll be, I'll be pretty booked for the next days, but, it, yeah. but if you can meet, I'll definitely make time for that. Good. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your feedback. And uh, uh, we'll, I'll also try to get in touch with the, uh, the no. phone friend and then okay. I will see if no, no, no. Go. I'm still not convinced what's the best solution. Maybe, maybe there is no clear. I'm going to lose audio again here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hear you. Maybe, maybe the problems are not so big and or maybe they're, yeah, whatever. <clears throat> I'm getting, it helps me also to clarify the model in my head and to get a better understanding myself talking about it. It, it always helps, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk to you, yeah. Okay, man. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.